Which brings us to tonight's film, Kill or Be Killed, uh, 2015. Uh, watch on Netflix. You boys, Netflix. 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 Uh, directed by Dwayne Graves and Justin Meeks. Cinematography uh, by some guy named Brandon Torres. I know I don't usually mention right up front the cinematographers. No, no, you don't. Uh, there's a good reason for that. He's joining us uh, right Yay. now. You're going to see a little Yay. picture pop up on the bottom of your YouTube screen of a, a smiling, handsome gentleman. Uh, Brandon Torres uh, is a old friend of mine. We actually used to did a film together, and uh, yep. I don't even know how long ago that was. Too damn long. How's that? Um, yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to date ourselves. No, I don't either. Uh, you can watch Underbelly on the Tuesday Night Cigar Club YouTube channel. It's out there, and uh, Brandon did wonderful work <laughs> on that as well. Uh, he was my gaffer extraordinaire. He made all the naked painted bodies. The I, the I light made the light dance off their 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 curves <laughs> and their. Uh, you just uh, he's a, he's a really talented guy, and when I. Knew we were looking for a, a southern film to do, and I saw this. I knew it would give us a chance to... We don't do this a lot. We talk with cigar guys, um, but we... Uh, and I'd like to do more of this where we get some, some film folks on the show yeah, and, yeah. and uh, kind of fill us in on some things about the movie. Uh, when did y'all make this, Brandon? 2015, 14? Uh, uh, year before, maybe, maybe yeah. Somewhere in a... Maybe year before that, yeah. Something like that. Okay. Year and a half of that. I can't remember. It's all a haze right now. Okay. Well, welcome to the Tuesday Night Cigar Club. <laughs> Hayes is our yeah. middle name. Um, is this a full blown western? I mean, you got horses. Is this your first feature? Is this you your got horses this, and guns? This it's it's a my, real western. This is not my first feature. Um, I did a couple of other features. Uh, three features before this. This is the first one I actually let people know that I did. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, I made it's, that mistake with Matt Cade. Hey, oh, hey. hey. Well, I, <laughs> oh, well, remember, I was gaffer on that one, so I really don't have any like, right to claim anything on that one. Uh, I remember the day I walked in on, uh, on on working on Underbelly. It was called something else, though, at first. What was it called? Uh, working title was On the Roadside of Town. That was it. Yeah. That nice. was it. Yeah. Uh, I remember walking in there, and, and I remember the day that we were doing all the naked bodies and stuff and I was just looking around and I looked over at, at, at Richard and I go you know my life isn't half bad <laughs> I mean <laughs> there were things I could be doing it, I, there was uh, very few complaining by the crew guys that night for some reason <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah we're all on best behavior of course but at the same time we're like you know you know, we could be working an office job. Fuck it. Uh, it was a good. It was a. It was a. It was a taxing, but a uh, a fun ten days. I'll give you that. Uh, I imagine you had a, a more generous shooting schedule on Kill or Be Killed. I would like to say yes, but um, we did six, seven pages a day on Kill or Be Killed. We had six weeks. And we traveled from, a lot of that is, is the travel in between. We went all the way from Van Horn, Texas, way, way off West Texas, all the way down to Corpus Christi and lost 18 tires along the way. And I think we hit a total of maybe just as many locations. So almost, uh, almost as many locations as we lost tires. Wow. And it was, uh, I think we, someone went to jail uh, some someone was actually very oh, one of our producers got prison ivy so bad it made his entire face close up. Yeah, <laughs> we had a lot of stories from that whole thing. Like whatever could go wrong went wrong. Um, my two good buddies uh, are the directors on that, uh, uh, Dwayne and, and Justin. Those guys, uh, those guys stuck their neck out to make this thing, and you know even they will tell you oh it's it's. It is what it is. It's not everything they wanted it to be right now, but like, dude, they're they're like what three movies in, and this is this is the one that actually got the second one that got sold and got put out there. And those guys, they risk everything. They put their neck out. They put their neck on the line to get stuff done. It's they're amazing to work with. Amazing to work with. Um. Well, and especially uh, I guess it's Justin who also is the the lead, um, yeah. playing lead too. So directing on top of 
uh, on top of being the lead performer, that's that's got to be just a I can't even imagine. It was pretty tough. It was pretty tough. He was uh, he's kind of a, a method actor, and so a lot of the way he directed had to do with uh, had to do with how I guess in a way Claude would possibly direct. So because it was between him and Dwayne, and they had a back and forth, always back and forth, always back and forth. And a lot of people were worried that oh you know they're they're bickering, but I think that's how they got through some of the better ideas is that neither of them were ever going to say yes I will do whatever you want to each other they they have this understanding that they intentionally are friends because they are not each other's yes man they they challenge each other every step of the way Dwayne would walk away and he goes there goes he, he he wouldn't even refer to him as Justin he'd go you know good old Claude good old Claude he'd joke around and Dwayne had his own little country accent he'd do and he'd joke around good old Claude Claude wants it this way Claude wants it that way but he joked because Justin was insane working on that thing. He very method, but very, very much. There's moments we're scared of him, but at the same time, he'd snap right out of it, and then he'd be just back to Justin, and we just didn't know. It was almost <laughs> like working with somebody that's bipolar. He just snapped in and out of crazy, well, and then well, I've got to do something like sign paperwork. <laughs> Well, it's, fun, it's funny you say bipolar because the movie to me has so many tonal shifts, you know, from comedy to really mm-hmm. dark on the on the on the flip of a dime to and some of the comedy is like naked gun police squad type goofball yeah. stuff. And then the next yeah. minute you've got like this this guy, you know, preying on a little girl in a really dark scene. And yeah. It kind of, in a way, not to keep going back to my movie, Underbelly, but no, but I mean, Underbelly had those tonal shifts where it kind of frustrated yeah. people where, you know, uh, we try to make you laugh and then the next minute we try to make you, you know, throw up. And yeah. and th- this this movie does kind of tonally go all over the place. Uh, was that, yeah. did you know that, I mean, were you... Did Are you we, get did you get so that from we, the script or was that was that on the page? We read the, script. we read the script. I think a couple of us realized that um the character Slap would be a little bit uh he'd be a little heavy handed if, if wasn't if he didn't guide they didn't guide it. But the reality is is um Oh, what the heck's his name? Uh it's awful that I'm not remembering his name. Uh Boyington uh played Slap. Look him up. IMDB. Uh Killer Be Killed. Either way, so he when he came in, he did all this stuff, and we're like, wow, that's over the top, it's over the top, it's a little too funny, a little too funny, but there's a certain aspect to that character that made Claude almost feel like he, I don't, it almost like he had to babysit him, like he was his younger brother in a way, like he, you know, he treated him like he had to constantly watch after him, so we, we left, we let it go. And there's a, uh, a longer cut that is a lot darker. Um, obviously, you know, when you sell something, producers get their hands in it, and they start going, well, this is a little too dark, this is a little too messed up, this is a little too intense. And so they decided to pull some of the darker stuff out, which made it feel more bipolar. Yeah. And, you know, they needed to slow the thing down. And Slap, basically, his character all over was was just it was goofy he was goofy and it wasn't necessarily like at the time we were like okay well we could balance this because we've done some really messed up stuff yeah and we've had the characters get to a really dark point when you do a, so, when you do a balance and then all of a sudden you're pulling out that darkness then you're left more with uh with all the happy stuff the slappy stuff i get, no, you're right. I, I get it you're right and, you know i mean there's that that scene where like he's got his finger cut off and there's a lot of darkness that went into that scene beforehand that led up to that, and then they decided edit-wise, well, let's just get straight to that a lot faster, and it get, it leads a lot funnier. Uh, some of that, I, I remember at the moment, Dwayne was like, I'm not sure, like, I, I want to let him play, because no matter what, the guy did variants on everything. The guy did all types of things. He's incredible in front of the camera. I think Dwayne had to look at it and go, well... I'm doing some messed up stuff in this movie so much that I kind of have to have yeah. some sense of comedy 
And I think mm-hmm. because the original cut was so dark, yeah, they really, really like strang- put a stranglehold on it. So I mean, I get it because Dwayne, Dwayne really pushed the envelope. Like that whole scene with um, that whole scene where Block Blocky goes into the uh, the little girls, the outhouse with the little girl. It's uh, we all felt really weird shooting it, and even uh, even the actor, it was really kind really nice guy <laughs> he felt a little weird and he had to go talk to the child he had to go talk to the girl and he had to go talk to people like they're not the way we shot it she's not actually involved in a lot of the creepy stuff yeah um it's just editing but i was about to say i, too, I feel for your editor he's got to feel creepy after that yeah yeah that was one of those things that like even the day we shot it and i'm i remember shooting this uh the scene with the girl's feet and I just feel like I, I I got up and I go, what am I what am I shooting? What am I doing with my <laughs> life? I'm uh, I feel like you know, and it it's dark. I mean, there's a certain point. It's it I'm I really wish they put the stuff in there that didn't apologize at all. Like um, because Dwayne and Justin have no problem making it darker. They will make something incredibly dark. But the problem being is, I think that when you're this new in the indie world you're not you're kind of handheld a little bit people don't want you to get that dark yet people don't want you to push a boundary yeah and it sucked because those guys if they were given the opportunity and they were really given the budget i think they can make something that could probably uh, really psychologically mess with people i mean you know you could tell it's there yeah um you could tell it's there and it was a balancing act and i think they they just had to lean one direction once producers got their hands on it. That makes sense. That makes sense. Uh, from a cinematography standpoint, um, I I thought you did some really, really cool stuff as far as the night exteriors. Um, I don't know. There's what? Maybe 85, 90 campfire scenes? Oh, there's, a, night, there's a ton. <laughs> there's, did, <laughs> yeah. did, did you guys just knock those out like in one night? Like, all right. Uh, let's move a fake, another fake tree, and I mean, these guys <laughs> no, must, no. these guys must have had like a hundred campfires. <laughs> I know, I know. I wish though, because like it would have been so much easier. But we had, we. It's kind of like every new location we went to. The question was, are we going to have a campfire scene? Yes, <laughs> yes. Like I almost got to the point where like, oh, we're at the brothel. Are we going to have a campfire scene in the brothel? <laughs> I almost expected it. Um, yes, we have the room yeah, right I, down the hall. I mean, those aren't easy scenes to shoot by no. any means. No, uh, no, not at all. The, um, the, so the crazy thing about it is I spent a lot of time, any time that we did something where uh, I'm dealing with any kind of firelight, we had flicker uh, magic gadgets all over the place, flicker boxes, uh, creating all variant uh, flickering. And I even had my cam ops look at me and go, you realize that very few people are going to see this this flickering feel, and I'm like, they're not gonna totally see it or pay attention to it, but they will feel it. Um, there's a certain aspect, subconsciously you get this idea of this weird flickering. Oh, absolutely. That happened. And, uh, and when we played with the campfire stuff, like I'd shoot the fire for a little bit, and I'd say, get rid of the fire, let's just make it my, my gag, and we'd just do the gag over and over again and get around it. And the reason I think we did a lot of those is because, um, Campfires, you know, if you went back and you looked over that stuff, a lot of that moment is when they, the first time they got a chance to actually sit down and talk to each other. Because if you're riding on horses, you're riding, you know, kind of in a trail or you're riding in a way that you can't talk to everybody. Plus, we actually cut down on a lot of our horse stuff where we did have them riding on horses real slow, talking to each other. Because the horses they brought in were horses from Galveston that, um, I think it was not Port, you know, it was Port A. I don't remember somewhere around there. Um, these horses weren't used to the new land or the land that we're we're dragging them from one side of Texas to the next, and the horses were pretty pissed. I mean, these animals don't like to travel. I mean, it's, who likes to travel like that, cooped up, and then all of a sudden get out and push you to perform? Uh, we did everything. I mean, trust me, the way they handled those horses was with kid gloves. They tried to. They were wonderful with them. Yeah. The horse wrangler himself was incredible. We had two of them. The They were both amazing. And I just feel like they cut out a lot of it. So then there was like, well, how do we get them to sit down and talk? Well, campfire, you know? We got to sit down and have them just talk <clears throat> at a fire. And then it got to the point where it's like, well, it's another fire. And it's like, well, where else are they going to go? They don't really have any 
buildings to go to. They don't really have any hotels to go to. I mean, they had one time that we show that, um, and it's, you know, that's one of the few times that we got a chance, and instead of showing them talking, we show all of them playing card games in one, and then Claude and and uh, Pearl. Ariana, Ariana's character, like them having, you know, them them getting it on with a, a dude tied up in the corner. So. Um, yeah. I, actually, I actually liked it because the, the campfire serves two really good mechanics. One, it creates an intimate setting so your characters can all, you know, bond that way in your, in your, vi- uh, your viewer bonds with the characters. And then two, yeah. it can also be creepy for like when the nighttime creepiness starts happening. So it's a very yeah. easy way to bring introduce both themes. Uh, agreed. It was, and it was I, a line. And yeah. I, I just thought from a technical standpoint, I mean, shooting at night's a bitch, no matter, you know, you're in the yeah. city. But when you're out in the country, I mean, to get the kind of detail and that natural, uh, like you said, that just that little attention with the flicker boxes. And uh, th- this movie, what it does really good, um, more so than I think it, than anything else is in the cinematography and in the sound design and because not only sound design but the actual location sound recording yeah for a movie that's what yeah. 90% outdoors uh, yeah. this does not have the horrible ADR that's often equated with indie film yeah. this doesn't have the shitty audio yeah. on location yeah. outside audio that's associated with indie films the dialogue was recorded masterfully, and t- t- what Brandon was talking about, as far as putting a flicker of light in the corner, who's going to notice? It's just texture. It's there, and it will help. The same thing with the sound design. When I'm watching a dialogue scene, and I can hear a horse eating in, in the far distance, or uh, like I just picked up on so many sounds that I knew were put there, art, you know, artificially. But that attention to layers and layers of yeah. of of detail building up, uh, th- this film does. But I see, I, I see pre- the I same. I, I, you very rarely see it, and I do appreciate it. I see the same challenges, and this was you said this was a eighteen day shoot. No, eighteen uh, locations, six weeks. six weeks. Six weeks, eighteen locations. Well, roughly around eighteen locations, but definitely eighteen tires were blown. So. <laughs> Around the same amount of tires blown as locations. So you've got go. six. You've weeks. got all those. You've got all those locations yeah, stretched out across time. But day. like you said, you got a whole bunch of outdoor shots. That's very tough to match up in camera. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. I I was uh, there was only one time that I had a condor, and was able to to put moonlight out, and I had to fight and put my foot down that it was this one scene because there is no campfire. Brandon, um, Brandon no for, our, for our listeners, for our listeners, what is a condor? Condor is a. Uh, I mean, to be honest, it's just one of those big lifts that you have when you have to when they have to repair electrical lines. Um, they call them a condor on set, but it's a. Uh, it's one of those cherry big picker. genie lifts. A cherry blue picker. Ones. Like a cherry, cherry picker. picker. Yeah. Okay. Boom go. lift. The cherry picker, and but it's the bigger giant one. So you wanted a they moon. Go, you wanted a moonshot. Oh yeah. <laughs> Got it. I needed the moon. I needed the moon, and this was the only time I was going to get it. And I had to fight for it because I was like, you guys aren't giving me fire. Because, I mean, I have to light with something. Right. And even though everybody is like, oh, the red, the red. The it, red, it yeah. Shoot low just... light. Well, that's bullshit. Speaking yeah, of. Uh... Bullshit. You, you can shoot in low light, but light is the key. You still have to have light. If you're out in the middle of the field and it's dark and you don't even have really that much moonlight because we shot in November. Yeah, it was uh, it was it was pretty tough, and man, getting that out there was was a, a pain in the ass. But you know, I had a, an amazing crew. Uh, Will Penson was my gaffer on this, and he just <laughs> I feel bad because being a gaffer, I often know what it's like to work with a DP who's asking for all these things, and I usually walk away and I'm like, you know, cursing his name, going that motherfucker, this and that, you know. So I just assumed, I just kind of hung my head and was like, okay, I'm pretty sure he's kind of pissed at me. But he got it done. Uh, I demanded some pretty big things from him, and he rose to the occasion every time. I was really, really excited about it. Um, The guy just, hand over fist, was like one of the, I think, one of the most important people uh, every day to me. He was the person I was, I was going out of my way going, how can I make his job easier? How can I make him happy? You know, because he was... 
it was incredible. He was incredible. He's willing to just jump in with me head first. See, that's something I never considered making movies as far as making other people happy. Yeah. And I yeah. heard you, you mumble, and I heard you mumbling that shit about me, Brandon, every day. But <laughs> but that's enough. We won't we won't harp on the past. Uh we we left as friends, that's all that matters. Yeah, it's his past, it's my and, present. You know, and here's and here's a filmmaking tip uh for all you new new beginners out there. Uh if you really want to keep your crew uh from bitching and moaning, hire a female director of photography. Because when she doesn't bitch at three in the morning, True. none of these guys True. are gonna say shit. And True. uh Yeah. It's true, but here's the thing, Sky made all of the G and E look like a bunch of babies. I kid you not. <laughs> yeah, uh, Sky Borgman was my my cinematographer on Underbelly, and uh, and uh, you guys actually worked really well together. You guys created. Uh, She's amazing. I uh, I contacted her recently, and I, I was sending her my stuff, and and just kind of going, "Hey, I've grown up." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were all just babies back then. Uh, yeah. Hey, speaking of night shots, real quick. Was the was the lightning in the film? Was that CG, or did you actually capture some lightning? That was that was that was post. That was post. We yeah, we no tried bad. we tried to go out of our way to capture stuff, but it was like, oh, we didn't. You know, this there was no storms whatsoever. It was just like <laughs> yeah. no clouds, and that's it. So uh, thought- it looked good. It it, it looked. I, I was I was on the fence with it. Uh, that that is one of the things that we always get uh, complimented on with Underbelly. Remember, we captured all that great heat lightning in the opening scene, and and everybody thinks it's fake, and it's like because it's like shooting at the perfect moments. It's like, yeah, no, nah, shit's real. Like, it just, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that just happened. Then well, I remember we were freaking out and going, uh, oh, "It's gonna rain on us. It's gonna rain on us." And then we just kept shooting through. It was it. like and six it never, hours of. It was, no, it was like six hours of amazing just heat lightning just all across the sky. Yeah. It was beautiful, incredible, and I. We really were hoping for that. Like we had, we had nights where we thought it was coming, and then it just was clouds, and that's it. And we're like, this sucks. So we kind of, uh, we kept saying that in Galveston, that's what we wanted. We knew we weren't going to get it, but we knew uh, if if we could get the sky a little bit. I got clouds. I got various things. I got a lot of plates of things. I'm sure that used some of the plates to put the the clouds together because we tried yeah. to do a few things with that. But most of that, I'm pretty sure, is maybe maybe 10 percent of composite of stuff we shot and the rest of it's just created well it's, it was gorgeous it, you did a good you did a great job matching uh scene from scene because there was a i know having that many varied locations has got to be playing and then plus also your nighttime to daytime stuff that's just got to be murder uh, a couple of scenes that i really really liked uh claude killing the mexican was uh yeah, really, really kind of cool. And framing wise, between the Mexican and then, I was kind of curious. There's the the upshot on Claude, where Claude's very frame right, and he got a bunch of open space on there. Uh, was there any particular thought process on that? Because I I liked it because you got a lot of that open space. You got the trees coming up behind him. Uh, he's very dominant on the right, but it's also it kind of isolates him and his target. Um, yeah. it's it's kind of one of these things where it's funny like you sit there and you watch and you think oh well the the cinematographer wanted this and the director is trying to get this emotion across no that's just how that is just how it which, happens which, sometimes. I'm sorry, which death is this oh it was about midway through the movie I think yeah Mexican guy who's uh, trying to hold back a woman who's trying to run away yeah and actually to be, be honest the original way we shot it there was a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of TNA or T in, in the there shot. Was, I, was, I was actually surprised. So like you saw a little bit of nipple on this. No, deal, no nipple, and, no nipple. And then yeah, there was a there, there was, was a TNA one there. Originally there was a lot. Originally there was a lot, but it, it shows for a brief flash. It's there. You see it, and uh, you do see it. And then, but it's I mean it's one of those you'd have to go back and search for it because they cut it down because originally they, you know, when you go to the American film market, they always do that thing where it's like, well, we need violence nudity and you know these these specific things that they ask for or they won't sell your movie and so these guys were like well you know we've got to we've got to follow through at least with some of the stuff the sexy stuff and they put it in but then editing wise i think even Dwayne was like it's superfluous it's stupid it looks like we're intentionally just showing boobs in this shot yeah. which um i thought it would have worked 
Yeah, I think I thought it would have too. Um, I think this thing they, needed uh, way, way, way more boobs. Yeah. They did a uh, they did a movie before this called Butcher Boys, and with Butcher Boys they had no boobs, and they had uh, they didn't have any boobs. They didn't have any stuff. But they had a girl that she opens up her her, uh, her top and she's supposed to flash these guys, and they see it from behind. And what's funny is the way I met Justin and, and Dwayne was they called me up and they go, well, we've got a lot of pickup shots we need to do. And I was like, oh, yeah, what are the shots? They go, well, we need tits here, we need tits here, we need tits here, we need tits here. And I was like, so you basically called me up to just be the guy to shoot a bunch of random boobs. <laughs> what do and I that sign? That was my job. So uh, I just shot a random bunch of random boobs and was like, all right. And then I had to match the lighting to what they already did. And... That's when uh, I, that's when we all we all goofed off, laughed, and uh, they they were like, "We like working with this guy. Let's try and uh, bring him in on this next thing." And voila, that's how that happened. So thanks to Justin Warren, actually, on that one. Uh, another underbelly uh, crew member. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he uh, he was he was the guy who got me involved with uh, with Butcher Boys, and that's that. It goes from there. You know, sometimes when I sit back, I'll just think of all the. The young, talented guys I discovered uh, back in the day, and to see them thrive and flourish uh, out in the entertainment industry, it just it warms my heart to see you guys doing so good. You know, Justin's doing Black Lightning right now. I do, I do, I, 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 yeah. I don't say a lot, but I do follow you guys on Facebook, and I'm always so happy when you guys are are doing good, and uh, right. it, uh, you know, it's it's a weird industry in that you know either. You leave a project, my experience is anyway, either you, you leave a project um, with, with, with kind of a, a strong emotional attachment to your crew um, or the exact opposite, and you just never want to see <laughs> these fuckers again. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, with, with, with Underbelly, I got really lucky in that... Uh, Man, uh, you just I, I had this this hardcore group of of, of just young guys who were, were just super talented and uh, um, and they're still doing it and uh, and they're they're doing even better. Um, I'm actually gonna go work with Richard in the next uh, three days. I go to work with Richard. He's gonna be uh, he and I are working on a feature in Dallas. Oh, cool! Uh, Richard Porter yeah. was my uh, key grip yeah. on Underbelly, so he he's he's all over the place. He does everything up, oh, yeah. up in North Texas. Um, well, man, I, I just, uh, you know, I, I was real proud of you watching this movie, Brandon, because, uh, you. you know, the, Westerns are hard. Uh, we, we've done quite a few of them here on the show. I'm not actually a fan of the genre myself. These guys are. Um, we, we've done a few moder the modern stuff. Uh, the Travolta one, uh, Valley of Violence. Then we, you know, we've gone all the way back to uh, Once Upon a Time. Once, Once Upon a Time, and uh, which one we do in America or Once Upon a Time in the West. Once Upon a Time in the West. Um, oh, nice. And Venice. And <laughs> Once Upon a Time in Venice. <laughs> That's a totally different story. Um, it took place out west. It was out west. <laughs> uh, real quick, let me just ask you, and then um, we won't keep you much longer. Did the directors ha have you sit down and watch certain westerns for a visual uh, stimulation, or did they actually give you scenes from uh, films and say this is what um, you know? For instance, the the scene where they take refuge in the psycho serial killer's Rudy, the old Rudy guy's house, yeah. who's, who's just killed his wife right before they showed up, and he poisons everyone's soup. You know, to me, that had a very Hans Landa uh, and Glorious Bastards kind yeah. of uh, vi yeah. vibe to it. I think his name was even Rudy Goebbels, like in the <laughs> Goebbels, yeah. Goebbels idea. Yeah. It was like a Mexican guy named Goebbels. That was, uh, yeah. he, first of all, he was amazing. That actor, uh, uh, Pepe, Cerna. Uh, Pepe Cerna. Pepe Cerna was amazing. Yeah, he was in Scarface. Uh, was he? Oh, yeah. Was he the little guy? Yes. He's yeah. been, that, I don't surprise you you didn't recognize him. He's been tons. And if you were a child of the 80s, man, every TV show, Knight Rider, A Team, Miami Vice. I was about to say, was he the guy in Miami Vice, the little snitch guy? Yeah, he was. He yeah. did that. Uh, besides, I mean, Scarface was oh. a huge show, but he also did uh, Caddyshack 2. Uh, he did. Yeah. Um, well, he's really gotten old over the last 40 years. 
Well, that happens. <laughs> it happens. Hey, you know what? Hey, hey. Hey, it happens to all of us. Look at you. Well, Look at you. well <laughs> Pepe Serna was, was really, really, he was one of the standouts in this movie. I actually thought they were going to spend you know, a lot, you a know lot who more. The guy I, was playing opposite of him. You know who was playing opposite of him, right? The first guy that dies in the soup? Yeah. Who's that guy? Leatherface. Oh, I think I did know from part three? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I knew. I, I, I knew. No, I think part two. Part two or part three. One or the other. I can't remember. Okay. I didn't keep up with it. Well, I did catch. That's uh, cool. I get set and I don't keep up. Like, these actors come in and I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're whoever. <laughs> uh, yeah, lighting's off. good. Go. Uh, well, I thought it was a good cameo from Ed Neal from the first Chainsaw. Uh, oh, yeah. Man, he's, yeah. A, he's a trip. Uh, oh, but, no. He's incredible to work with. Incredible guy to work with. I think I've worked with him three times now. Well, real quick, just circle back. Uh, what what kind of stuff did they have you watch? What was the cinematic influences going into this? So uh, the funny thing is, they they had a set no- a set number of movies. They were like kind of hoping that I would say. Cause, I mean, obviously they met me from Butcher Boys, but they still brought me in, sat me down, talked to me, and they said, "Okay, what do you what do you see when you read when you read the script?" And uh, I brought up, I just brought up like certain things and certain elements from Outlaw Josie Wales. Uh, I brought up, um, I mean, I I went through the Spaghetti Westerns and I brought up elements and scenes that I specifically liked. Um, I also, you know what's funny? It's, I brought up, you brought up uh, Inglorious Bastards and I brought up, I said, you know, I feel like this needs a revival Spaghetti Western feel like you would see in a kind of Tarantino-esque way. And I said, but I would also, and I said, if given my druthers, I would, uh, and this is, mind you, I didn't get a chance to do any of this, but if uh, you ever get a chance to see The Good, Bad, and The Weird. Um, I have seen it. Korean film. I love that movie. It's, it's phenomenal. I, I actually saw it. The director uh, directed Arnold's comeback film after he was governor, uh, Last Stand. Last yeah. Stand. That was kind of yeah. his big American uh, debut, but I went back and watched some of his earlier stuff and the good, bad, the weird was kind of his big, uh, claim. that movie's crazy. Yeah. It's a really good movie. I love that movie. That's one of my favorites. And there's a lot of it, uh, a lot of stuff that's on the cutting room, cutting room floor. I wish they used, there's a scene where we laid down. Uh, I think it was, I think we had four, four sticks of eight track plus a four foot. And I'm on a Fisher, um, we're using Fisher, we're using Chapman, we're using Leonard Chapman, uh, Chapman Leonard, we're using Chapman Leonard uh, dolly. So basically, I'm on the dolly. Uh, I can't remember which one's uh, Pee Wee Three, maybe I don't know. One of the the medium sized ones. For our, list- for our listeners, this is dolly track. This is this is basically ri- think railroad tracks that are laid down mm-hmm. on location, and then the camera is mounted on basically a, a dolly uh, on those tracks. And I imagine you use that for all the horse. All the horse rides and... We, we did use some of it for the horse rides. What we did this one for is we had this whole line going straight towards this mound. At the very beginning of the movie, uh, Claude, Claude's buried in a hole and he comes up from this mound and he's just firing away. Well, when I originally did this, uh, I told them I want to do a smash zoom. And they were like, smash zoom? And I said, just trust me on this. It's kind of a new... Uh, it's, it's kind of an old old uh, spaghetti style western thing that is coming back that has been made new um we had these um we had these Push-pull? old it, you're talking about a, you're talking about a trombone shot yes well no no not trombone shot no no i'm talking the going in 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 like push 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 in I guess that is trombone shot, right? Well trombone, trombone shot, shot is when you when you do, you you zoom in as you're dolling backwards no 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 definitely not that definitely not that i'm talking about you know, you're talking about the Charles smash. Charles Bronson eye shot in Once Time in the West, where you keep going to where you think the camera's gonna actually like hit him in the face. Yes. Okay. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about that zoom. So we actually had I was, <laughs> I was sitting on the focus, and the lens is about freaking yay big off the front of the camera, right? It's weighing the thing down. I'm using it to control everything. I mean, it's huge. It's it's large. Uh, I would say, you know, I mean, it's um, it's an old uh, it was an old. It was an, uh, an old anamorphic. I can't remember which lens it was right now. 
But I'm sitting here, I'm holding this thing. My uh, my cam up slash AC, he's sitting there and he's like, okay, I'm ready to just crank this thing and zoom forward. And I basically got Dan Siegelstein on the back of this. This is, uh, we called him the muscle Jew. He, uh, I mean, this guy's ripped. Ripped as can be. Oh, he, every day he took his shirt off so he could show off to all the ladies. <laughs> but he would sit there and here's my fat ass on the dolly, my cam ops fat ass on the dolly. And he'd be sitting there and hitting him like, dude, you got a lot of runway. I just need you to run and I need you to hit it. And then I need you to come to a stop. And I need you to like, bam, hit this mark. So he'd run down this whole thing. And at the same time, my cam up would slam the zoom forward at a certain point, And I would focus at a certain point and we'd hit it. And we'd oh, go sweet. in to this firm where basically Claude gets up and we go boom, boom, boom. Like it just, it you can see it in stages, it goes, one, two, three, up to him pulling the guns out, pop, 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 pop. Problem being is the props would not always fire correctly. Uh. <laughs> Every time we did it perfectly, the guns went pop, clack, 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 and they didn't work. And I was like, damn it. There's one good one, and I wish it had last, it lasted and made the cut, but it didn't. They only uh. used, like, the tail end of it. And uh, But, yeah, that was one of my favorite moments in the entire thing. Also, the scene at the beginning where you go and you're looking at all the people, I actually got on underneath the dolly in a tarp and the, the sun's beating down one of the few times and, and I'm sitting there and I'm just kind of blindly pulling this focus with this weird uh, lens flare that's coming at me and all this dust that's kicking at me as I'm moving through and they cut it and only use the last third of the shot nah. in the entire thing. So, you know, it's editing. They're like, hey, we got to speed things up. But that's majority of everything that landed on the cutting room floor are these things where I went and I'm like sweeping the camera over and I'm moving around. And and it's stuff that I would love to have had. And Dwayne even said, he goes, I would love to have had it, but we were forced to cut, 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 yeah, cut. Yeah, but you know what? Never- but you know what, Brandon? I mean, in their defense, I'll say this. It is a very disciplined film in that yeah. it's shot so traditionally. There, there's no handheld... It's it's just it's 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 you know it looks like it could actually have, there are handhelds I just don't know I'm I'm sorry a very very subtle um, yeah. No, it is. yeah without bringing attention calling attention to themselves handhelds uh, so I could see where maybe some of the more uh, adventurous shots may have uh, been a little visually yeah. out of, out of place um, I had oh. to have that moment where a director comes in and and sets down and goes he looks at me and he goes now listen. Story is king. Story, Story is, is king. Because yeah. I know you want your big shot, <laughs> and you want to be able to see this vista, and you want to look up into the sun. It's like that's great, but story is king. And I was like, "Damn it, man! The right. camera is and telling he a story." Goes, one day, yeah, he's like, "One day, I promise you. I promise I will give you all of the shots you want to do." And I'm like, "Okay." That day never comes. What uh, what camera did you use? The red. We were shooting on the uh, the red red epic. Okay. Okay. At the time, it was the Red Epic had just come out, and uh, and we were using uh, we had a series of different lenses. I had to go through different lenses for different looks. Um, we went as far down as the what is it? The anamorphic Loma Lomos, the Konas. I had an Ingenue uh, anamorphic that we played with. Um, really, it was all just depending upon a couple of ideas of where we were and how we wanted each thing to look. So I did jump around. If you notice, there's sometimes that there's weird lens aberrations, and that's when I just like was like, give me the oldest, funkiest lens <laughs> I can. And this is what sucks is this is right before the right before Cook released their uh, their anamorphics, and that's actually what I was hoping that I would be get that we'd be shooting the movie just at the time that they'd release their anamorphics, and then they were like, no, we're pushing it back another six months, and I was like. Damn it, damn it, damn it. So we went with more um, characteristic glass. Okay. Uh, I like that term, characteristic glass. Um, Well, my man, uh, you you should be proud of your work. Uh, You should be proud of the film. Uh, We are going to now uh, cut you loose so we can spend the next three hours uh, dissecting it scene by scene, ripping it apart, ripping it to hell. Uh, which you know, I definitely don't want you here for that. <laughs> oh yeah, well I've done that a million times. Trust me. Um, I, one I did want to share with you some point in time. Yeah. Just to tell you a little bit about 
the guys, just to give you an idea what these uh, guys that we're dealing with, there was a, I wonder if Justin's going to kill me if I tell this story. So we're in, this is a, you know, a couple weeks before we're starting to shoot. We're, we're already, this is between our location scouting, between getting everything together and trying to set our stuff up. We're driving out these railroad ties all the way out to Van Horn. Now, mind you, Justin and our UPM and a couple of other people on our crew that decided to follow along, they decided, oh, well, we're going to go drinking. We're going to, you know, we're going to drink, and then we're also going to smoke a little bit. Um, I don't know what they're smoking. I don't know. I'm not. Don't ask me. Um, but they decided they're just going to get a little wild, a little crazy, party a little bit, and they're like, Brandon, you need to stay with the truck because you're driving. So I get no fun. <laughs> Um, that's okay. I was okay with this because apparently we were driving right down this this path that they that they pull people over periodically for checking for drug running and you know if, if illegals are coming over all that fun stuff. We get pulled over. I'm actually starting to panic because here's uh, here's you know Justin going just hide everything, hide everything, just put it in them to seat, you know whatever. And I get asked to step out, and it's apparently there's a tail light out in the trailer that's holding all these railroad ties. And Justin steps out too, because he's the truck owner, right? And he's like, "Look, it's my truck." And he goes and steps out. He goes, "Can I go look?" He goes out there. The officer starts talking. He goes, "What are you guys doing? Just giving us, you know, asking every question. Really, just kind of like looking at my records, looking at Justin's records, looking at everything." And Justin's just sitting there shooting the shit with him. And Justin's the kind of guy that he walks up and he just turns automatically into this charm, this like, this fucking, I don't know, he can charm the shit out of anybody. And he looks right at the cop and he's just sitting there, he goes, you know, you got it, like, you got a good look, you'd be an actor, you could be an actor, like, just fucking charming him. And then he's sitting there and the guy's asking, you know, what are you doing? He goes, we're making a movie, we're doing this, we're doing a western. He goes, oh yeah, I love westerns. He goes, yeah, what, what's your favorite western? And... He's talking to him, and he just sits there, and he goes, hold on. He stops for a moment, and he just lifts his leg and farts as loud as he can. And then without a beat, turns back to him and goes, so this is what we're doing. And then just is, like, scratching his nuts right there in front of him. And then goes to shake his hand. And I'm just like, it's the way he's acting. And he's just, like, you know, right there in front of the cop. And the cop's looking at him like, okay. And I'm just looking back going, I've never seen someone just, like, turn and, like, lift their leg and fart the direction of a cop just kind of like oh hold on i gotta fart <laughs> and then the cop looks and he's just laughing his ass off and the cop just goes man look you guys be safe out there you need to pull over into this stop get some rest it's getting late he goes i wouldn't want anything to happen to you i want to see this movie and i had never ever seen a person just work so much charm and magic to a to a police officer who honestly when he pulled us over was just trying to find something and that's something about Justin and Dwayne that what's interesting is Justin's that guy and Dwayne is the meticulous like he'll lock himself away and he'll edit for fucking ever and he'll 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 drive himself nuts to get the absolute perfect timing and he'll he'll get it down to a frame and the two of them are so different, but you put them together, and for some reason, they become this incredible dynamic. And the entire process of shooting that thing was stressful, painful. It was scary, and it was nuts. And there are days we're asking, why the hell are we doing this? It's like that Rick and Morty episode when they both get in there, and they're like, why are we doing this? Why do we keep doing this? I don't know, Morty. <laughs> that was it every day. We felt like that, but something about those two guys that every time they got on set and they talked to you, they made you feel like you're doing something really fucking special, really badass. And I guarantee you this film better than the last one. The last film better than the one before. The next two that they have planned are going to be amazing. And I really highly recommend keeping an eye out them and uh if you get a chance get them on your show they're a lot of fun uh i i will uh keep an eye out only on your recommendations sir you see Tut, that's what a good dp does they take every opportunity to praise the directors uh-huh yeah uh-huh uh, yeah you launched that fucker's career and you killed mine <laughs> uh, 
We need, we need to edit that out. Uh, uh, did, did you hear that, Brandon? I'm sorry. Uh, th- this is why we don't do a lot of interviews. Usually it breaks down into a, a family spat. And, uh, and now Tut's crying. Uh, Life is over. Well, usually that happens at the 30-minute mark. This is actually pretty good for us. This is actually pretty good for us. We're improving. Um, well, uh, you know what? I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna touch base with you here soon. Uh, I owe you a beer, so let's uh, get together next time I'm in Austin. Uh, let, let's uh, and Tut, you can come. All right. Yeah, I guess. Uh, All right. Let's nice. let's get together. Let's talk shop and uh, and do this the right way instead of through these silly screens. Um, but I'll introduce you guys to a couple of prop breweries uh, that would love to uh, donate to your show. Uh, well, you know what? I, I don't make movies anymore. I'm a professional drinker. And, uh, hey, I, that's, they're professional beer makers, so you guys go hand in hand. My, my fan base you is... got your peanut butter <laughs> and my chocolate. Uh, I... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, uh, dude, I appreciate it, buddy. I appreciate you taking the time, and uh, you're a good dude. Everybody, uh, if you are um, in the in the business of shooting films and you're looking for a talented guy who brings not just, I mean, you know, you can watch Kill or Be Killed. You can watch his reel. You can, you can see a lot of what Brandon's done, but he really does bring something cool to a set. Um, he's, just, he's just a really solid uh person and a, a really funny guy and uh like you know you said you had six weeks on this you know we shot a movie in 10 days and you can't do that unless everybody is um a, a, you know a character of, of worth and brandon mixes talent with that as well so seek him out uh, you got a website or anything people can go to brandon brandon dot com BrandonTorres.com. There you go. Uh, uh, so my IMDb is imdb.com backslash Brandon Torres. And uh, yeah, fuck, I don't have Twitter. My Facebook is Brandon Torres. I mean, anything. Brandon Torres. You just look for me. I'm uh, the first one on IMDb. Find <laughs> him and uh, and uh, and talk shop with him and, and, uh, and just uh, watch Killer Be Killed. Uh, because, uh, like I said, uh, the things that worked best for me here, a lot of that had to do with you. So uh, good work, my man. Thank you. Thank you. I I enjoyed it, and uh, it's got its flaws. <laughs> hey, what, do, what doesn't? We all say that. Um, yeah. Especially Tut. But, uh, <laughs> oh, my God, I said that out loud. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, we'll, hear a little bicycle bell out there in a little bit. <laughs> we'll touch base. Uh, we'll touch base down the road, brother. I'll talk to you soon. Take care. Thanks, Have man. All right, bud. I get up, go to work, get drunk, go to sleep. I get-